Ignore it. Ignore it. I know y'all see it. Let's not talk about it. The brows. They're looking bad, but I didn't want to do my brows on camera, so I started the brows off, and this is pretty much how um, I'm going to start the brows. But um, basically, it's it's been a while. Hi. Did you miss me? It's been a minute, not going to lie. It's been a fat, fat, fat minute. Um, indeed, indeed, back and better than ever. If I'll stay back, haven't decided yet because Lord knows I'll be on my grind for a couple weeks and then I'll not be on my grind. So, um, good in the hood. It's really good in the hood. Cool with the school. Um, great with the gates. You feel me? This is what we're going to start off with. The brows, like, done, but not done. Um... But yeah, I've been focusing on a lot of different things. Mainly with just all social medias, not just YouTube. That's why I've kind of been like neglecting YouTube. But if you want to see me, I'm very active on my TikTok. So, let's just get straight into today's video. Um, basically, I'm talking about a case. This is the case of the McDonald's Massacre. If you're not sure, if you don't know what this is, it's a massacre that happened at McDonald's. Like the name implies um a bunch of people died at a mcdonald's and it's all because of this one man now let's get straight into the story of the mcdonald's massacre of 1984 so as you guys can see i obviously already have my makeup done um so i think it's important to talk about childhood james oliver huberty was born in canon canton ohio um he was the second of two children born to Earl Vincent, a quality inspector, and Isol Evelone Huberty, which was his mother, a homemaker. Both parents were devoutly religious and the family were regular attendees of a local United Methodist Church. When James was three, he contracted polio um, to minimize the debility, the debility of his alignment. He was required to wear steel and leather braces upon both legs um he made a progressive recovery and it really only gave him a mild limp for the remainder of his life in 1950 earl huberty his father purchased a 155 acre farm in mount eaton um eichel his eisel his mother refused to live in a rural area and refused to view even view the property shortly thereafter eisel abandoned her family to perform sidewalk preaching um, she basically left Huberty, abandoned him and his father because she didn't want to live in the area, which if you're going to buy a home with someone, make sure they want to live there. But then again, also don't leave your children. Oh, Huberty, James' father, he reports saying that, um, he went outside and he saw his son crying by the chicken coop, saying that it was really devastating and it was just really sad because his mother left and he was upset about it. Um... Huberty was a sullen child with a few friends. Um, his primary his primary interest was target practice. A family acquaintance would later describe him as a queer little boy who practiced in, in necessity with a target pistol. By his teens, Huberty was something of an amateur gunsmith. Due to his limp, his family's extreme religious beliefs and his reluctance to socialize with peers, Huberty was frequently targeted by bullies. At high, in high school. An average scholar, he graduated 51st out of his class of 77 students in 1960. In 1962, Huberty enrolled at the Malone College where he initially studied sociology before opting to study at the Pittsburgh Institute of Mort Mortuary Science in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He graduated with honors from the Institute in 1964, being issued with a funeral director's license and the following year an L. Bomber's license. In 1965, Huberty married Etna Markland, whom he had met while attending Malone College. Shortly after his marriage, he obtained employment at a funeral home in Campton. Huberty's introvert personality made him ill-suited with dealing with members of the public, causing minor conflicts with his superiors. Nonetheless, James worked in his profession for two years before opening, opting to become a welder for a firm in Louisville. He worked at this firm for two years before securing a better paid position 
at Badcock and Wilcox in 1969. Liberty's employers considered him a reliable worker. He willingly would work overtime to even earning promotions by mid-1970s regularly between 2500 and 30000 per year. Shortly after Huberty was hired by this firm, him and his wife moved into a three-story home in the op affluent section of Missoulin, Ohio. In the winter of 1971, the home was destroyed in a fire. Shortly thereafter, James and Etna bought another house on the same street. They later built a six-unit apartment building on the grounds of their first home, which they managed. Huberty had a history of domestic violence, frequently slapping or punching his daughters, holding knives to their throats, and beating on his wife. On one occasion, Etna filed a report to the Campton, Canton Department of Children and Family Services saying that her husband had messed up her jaw, although she later insisted the majority of occasions he assaulted her, he struck her only once. Beginning in 1976, Etna repeatedly attempted to persuade her husband to seek counseling and affiliate his sources in stress, although he refused to seek any form of therapy. Any efforts to pacify her husband's temper and anxiety through general paranoia and to both influence and control his behavior by reading or playing tarot cards. Huber believed her. Etna's readings would pronounce a temporary calming effect, and Huberty would typically follow the recommendations his wife made in the readings. A co-worker would later recollect, upon being notified by the impending closure of the engineering firm, Huberty had made a comment indicating that if he was unable to provide for his family, he intended to commit suicide and take everyone with him. According to Etna, after her husband became unemployed, Huberty began hearing voices in early 18, 1983. He placed a loaded pistol against his temple, threatening to commit suicide. Etna successfully dissuaded her husband from shooting himself, although he later remarked to her, you should have let me shoot myself. Unable to find lasting, long-lasting employment in Ohio, James and Etna Huberty sold their six-unit apartment for $115,000 in the spring of 1983. Shortly thereafter, Huberty obtained alternate welding em employment with a union metal manufacturing company. This employment lasted five weeks before the closure of the plant. In the summer of 1983, the Huberties applied for residency in Mexico, believing the money obtained from the sale of their apartment building would financially sustain the family longer in Mexico than America. Having had also sold their home just for $12,000 in cash in September, with the buyer assuming the $48,000 mortgage, Huberty informed family acquaintances of his intentions to relocate his family to Tijuana in search of employment opportunities, confidently stating, we're going to show them who's boss. Huberty moved his family from Ohio to Tijuana in 1983. He left the most essential of his family possessions in storage in Ohio, but in short, he bought his huge collection of guns, ammunition, and survival supplies with him. Huberty was still unable to find employment in Tijuana, he regretted his decision and moved to Mexico very quickly. Within three months, the family relocated to San Ysidro, a large, a largely poor district of San Diego, just to the north of the U.S.-Mexico border, which in 1984 had a population of 1,300. They rented an apartment within the Cottonwood Apartments. The fact his family were the only Anglo-Americans within the apartment complex irritated Huberty, who was notably ignorant to his neighbors. Shortly thereafter, Huberty applied to a newspaper advertisement offering security guard training and a federally funded program. He completed his course on April 12th and soon obtained employment within a security firm in Chula Vista, assigned with a guarding condominium complex. The money earned enabled the family to have furniture shipped from Ohio and the family relocated to a two-bedroom apartment on the Avril Road the same month. July 10th, Huberty, Huberty was summarily dismissed from his job. His employers informed Huberty the reasons for his dismissal were his poor work performance and noted general physical insta instabil instability. Just eight days before the whole incident took place, Huberty was let go from his job because of his poor work performance. He he just wasn't fit for it. It all started in San Ysidro. I'm going to say San Ysidro because that's how it's spelled. I'm not too sure on how to say it. I'm not going to lie to y'all. Like, I'm not even going to hold y'all at all. I am not sure at all how to say this word. Basically, San Diego, California in San Ysidro. Um, I'm assuming that's the county or whatever, but this is where that all took place. So this is Cali on July 18th, 1984. It's called the McDonald's Massacre of 1984, or some of you may know it as 77 Minutes. 
um because that's how long this this situation took place which is so crazy that this whole thing went on for 77 minutes imagine how terrifying it must have been to be in that particular place at that time like terrifying right and the fact that it lasted so, as long as it did is absolutely insane to me on july 18th 1984 a 41 year old man by the name of james huberty Um, a 41 year old man by the name of James Huberty he committed a crazy crime on July 15th um, James he went up to his wife and he commented to her and he said hey look I think I have a mental illness I think I have a mental problem you know he just thought he had a mental illness he told his wife so two days later he um two, day two days later the morning of july 17th james actually called a mental health clinic in san diego and he requested an appointment however he was told to just leave his contact details and that they would get back to him within several hours so james sat by the phone according to his wife for several hours waiting for this call back from the san diego mental health clinic um he just sat by there he left his details with the receptionist she told him it was gonna be a couple hours he waited for a couple hours nothing happened he didn't get a call back no one returned to him no one got back to him so James kind of just went on about his day and um he finally left the phone after several hours of waiting after waiting by the phone for several hours James finally left the family home he went to an unknown location no one's quite sure where he went um and he obviously can't tell anyone but yeah he left the house um it's not clear where he went no one knows if you know he was out scoping places or if he was planning anything or if he had anyone targeted but he he just left for a couple hours didn't say anything and just didn't tell anyone where he was um then it was to james when he left that the receptionist that took his information and got his contact details she actually spelt his name wrong she actually spelt schuberty instead of james huberty it was schuberty not only that but the way James was talking was a very mellow and calm voice. So the receptionist didn't get any form of urgency from his voice. So she didn't assume it was a big urgent problem. So she put him on the non-crisis inquiry, which instead of several hours like they originally told James, it actually meant 48 hours you would get reached out. You would get reached out to within 48 hours instead of several but they assumed just because of the urgency in his voice, he had a very mellow and calm voice. They assumed it was not a big deal. The receptionist didn't think he was in any type of serious situation because of the his voice was very calm. His voice didn't indicate any sense of emergency. So if, instead of letting someone get back to him in a couple of hours, the receptionist put him on a serious, on a non-serious inquiry, which meant someone would get back to him in 48 hours instead of several instead of a few so that's a very very big jump and he was waiting at the phone so for them like i feel like maybe even if okay even if that were the case and you don't put them on a state of urgency maybe you should call back and say hey listen um i don't know what your situation is but we put you on for 48 hours so you won't be getting a phone call, a call back with, for another 48 hours not a couple of hours like you like we originally told you i feel like you call back and tell someone that but they didn't do that so once again, I feel like that's a mistake on the, on their fault, on their part, but then again. The following morning, July 18th, the day after his call with the receptionist, um, him not getting called back, you know, all that, the day after that took place, the morning after, James and his wife went to the zoo with their whole family, so, you know, they just all went to the San Diego Zoo. Him and, he, him, his wife, and his kids went to the zoo. Um, they just walked around the zoo and when they were walking around the zoo, James actually told his wife, um, that he believed his life was effectively over. Like, he believed his life wasn't really worth anything and he felt like it was pretty much already over. Just, just saying crazy stuff at this point. If your husband's making all these claims, like, I have a mental illness, I feel like my life is over, I feel like you shouldn't take that lightly, especially because... He seems like a psychopath, but then again, his wife could very much show be a victim, and he said that to his wife, um, and that 
quote, society has their chance. That was James' quote. After he left the zoo with his family, they went to the McDonald's at the Claremont neighborhood, and then after that, they returned home after eating lunch. The Hubert family returned home shortly after they So Edna was laying down, and James leaned in to give her a kiss and said, I want to kiss you goodbye. Edna asked where he was going, um, because she was planning on making dinner. Like, she was planning on making dinner that night. She thought it was a normal night. Everything was fine, so she goes, okay, when are you coming back? I'm making dinner, hon. James then literally said, I'm going hunting. Hunting for humans. Now, I don't know about you, but if my significant other comes up to me and says, hey, I think I have a mental illness. My life is effectively over. I want to kiss you goodbye. I'm going hunting for humans. That's a red flag to me. You know, like that's a, I'm gonna call the police, hon, you need, you need help. Like he left the home, he left the family home. On his way out of the door, he told his daughter bye. He said, bye, I won't be back. Um, literally telling the family that like, basically just, just being like a psycho. And like, they didn't say anything. They didn't do anything. They didn't think anything of it. Like, I don't, I don't know. It, to me, it's just all sketchy. That just seems like something you would, you know, be like, okay, you're, you're being weird. Or even, like, getting emotional. Like, if my dad's, like, if my dad left my house and was like, I'm never coming back, I would, like, cry and stuff and, like, try and get him to stay. But it didn't seem like anyone in the home cared. Honestly, it just seemed like, okay, bye, dad. Like... It was almost like they were acting like this was a normal thing for him to do or normal behavior for him, which that's not normal for anyone. So he told his daughter, he said, bye, I won't be back. And then he just left the home. <laughs> the craziest part to me is the fact that when he told his wife, I'm going hunting for humans, he had a gun strapped across his chest. Like a, he had a box of ammo, like a box full of ammo. And he had a blanket and wrapped up in it, he had a bundle. So, I mean, it just was almost like they, he, they knew what he was doing and he just, they just didn't care. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But he literally like straight up told her, I'm going to go hunt for humans. Had a gun around him, literally carrying a bundle, a box of ammo, and still no one said anything to anyone. Everyone just acted like this was like okay for him to do and say and act that way. Hooverty then drove down the San Yuzito Road and he drove he drove down San Yuzito Boulevard and he drove down and he went to a supermarket and then he went towards a postal a post office branch um before entering a McDonald's parking lot. At approximately 3.56 p.m. on July 18th, he drove his car into the McDonald's parking lot. In his possession was a 9mm Browning, HP semi-automatic pistol, 9mm millimeter Uzi carbine, a Winchester 1200 19-gauge pump action shotgun filled with hundreds of rounds of ammo for each weapon. So each weapon had hundreds of bullets ready to be fired. There were a total of 45 customers in the McDonald's at the time when James approached and entered the McDonald's. Upon entering the McDonald's minutes later, James first aimed his shotgun. When he entered the McDonald's, he first aimed his shotgun at a 16-year-old employee named John Arnold. Um, as he did this, the assistant manager, Gil Gilmero Flores shouted, Hey, John, this guy's going to shoot you. James pulls the sh pulls the trigger and nothing happens like nothing happened he pulled the trigger and nothing happened so I mean <clears throat> according to Arnold when James pulled the trigger nothing happened I guess it was jammed or something because James just started like inspecting his gun while pointing it at this like 16 year old kid James started inspecting the gun and while he was inspecting the gun 22 year old Neva Kane walked towards the counter towards Arnold because they believe the situation was just a big joke like 
this guy walks into your your restaurant because when you're the manager it's like your restaurant that's what they call it but this guy walks into your restaurant with a gun he aims it at one of your one of your workers and then it just doesn't go off so the manager walks up thinking it's like a, just a sick terrible joke the manager walked up because the gun didn't go off so they assumed it was a joke and they were like okay i'm assuming they walked up to maybe kick him out or tell him to leave or i don't know why why he walked up all i know is james got his gun unstuck so james fired a shotgun towards the ceiling before aiming the uzi at kane the manager shooting her once below her left eye kane died within minutes yeah, he aimed his gun at the ceiling, and then he shot the manager, Kane. She died within minutes. Uh, she got shot right under her left eye. Super sad. She was only 22. She was so young. Let her soul rest in peace. Immediately after shooting Kane, um, James fired his shotgun at Arnold, the 16-year-old worker, wounding the teenager in the chest and the arm before shooting, shouting at everyone to get on the ground. So after James tells everyone he gets on the ground, he starts referring to everyone as, quote, dirty swines and assholes before claiming to have killed a thousand and intended to kill a thousand more. Upon hearing Hubert's rant, 25-year-old Victor Riviera attempted to persuade Hubert not to shoot anyone else. In response to that, James got really frustrated that someone would have the nerve to do that. So then he shot, he shot Riviera, 25 year old Riviera, 14 times, repeatedly shouting, shut up. He's like, this guy's dead, like, this guy's dead, like, let's, this guy's dead. And the whole time this other guy's just doing, shut up, because Riviera's trying to plead with him. As Riviera screamed in pain, customers around started hiding under booths and getting in ta under tables and just trying to hide from James. So as everyone's hiding under staffs and under tables and booths, James turned his attention to six women and children huddled together. He first killed 19 year old Maria Colmerno Silva. I'm so sorry if I butcher any names. I, I'm not, that's, I feel like that's very disrespectful and I'm not in any way trying to. I'm so sorry if I butcher any names. Um. He first killed 19-year-old Maria Carmenio Silva with a single gunshot to the chest, then fatally shot 9-year-old Claudia Perez in the stomach, cheek, thigh, hip, leg, chest, back, armpit, and head with his Uzi. He then wounded Perez's 15-year-old sister Imelda once in the hand with the same weapon and fired upon 11-year-old Aurora Pina with the shotgun. Pina, initially wounded in the leg, had been shielded by her pregnant aunt, 18-year-old Jackie Reyes, Huberty shot Reyes 48 times with his Uzi beside his mother's body. Beside his mother's body, eight month old Carlos Reyes sat up and wailed, whereupon Huberty shot at the child, then killed the baby with a single pistol shot to the center of the back. Huberty then shot a 60 year old, 62 year old trucker named Lawrence Verlis, Ver, Versilis before targeting a family seated near the play area of the restaurant who had to try to, sh who had tried to shield their son um, and his friend beneath the tables with their bodies. 31-year-old Blythe Re Reagan Herrera had shielded her 11-year-old son Mateo beneath one booth as her husband Ronald protected Mateo's friend, 12-year-old Keith Thomas, beneath a, bo a booth directly across from them. Ronald Herrera urged Thomas not to move, shielding the boy with his body. Thomas was shot in the shoulder, arm, wrist, and left, left elbow, but was not seriously wounded. Ronald Herrera was shot six times in the stomach, chest, arm, hip, shoulder, and head, but survived. His wife, Blythe, and his son, Mateo, were both killed by numerous gunshots to the head. Nearby, three women who also attempted to hide beneath the booth, 24-year-old Guadalupe Del Rio, lay against a wall. She was shielded by her friends, 25-year-old Gloria Ramirez and 31-year-old Ariz Delci Ville. I can't say this name, but it's Ariz Delci, like... I'll put it on the screen. Um, Del Rio was hit several times but was not seriously ruined, wounded. Ramirez was unhurt, whereas Vargas received a single gunshot wound to the back of the head. She died to her un She died to of her wound the next day. The only person fatally wounded who lived long enough to reach a hospital. At another booth, Huberty killed a forty five year old banker, Hugo 
Vel, Vel, Velisquez Vasquez with a single shot to the chest. The first many the first of many calls to emergency services was made shortly after 4 8 p.m. notifying police of the shooting of a child who had been taken to a post office on San Ysidro Boulevard. They said the first call was made after shortly after 4 p.m. He had pulled up to the McDonald's at 4 356, waited in his car a little bit, and his gun got jammed. They could have been there before he even killed all those people. But, of course, the dispatcher, the dispatch, the dis, the dispatcher literally sent them to the wrong McDonald's. He, shortly after 4 p.m., a young woman named Lydia Flores drove into the parking lot, stopping at the food pickup window. Flores noticed, noticed, Flores noticed shattered windows and the sound of gunfire before looking up and there he was just shooting flores reversed her car until she crashed into a fence she hid in some bushes with her two-year-old daughter until the shooting ended at approximately 4:05 p.m a mexican couple asto astelafo and marcelia felix drove toward one of the service areas of the restaurant nothing not noting the shattering laminated glass Asilio instantly assumed renovation work was in progress and that Huberty striding towards the car was a repairman. Huberty fired a shotgun and Uzi at the couple and their four-month-old daughter, Carlita, striking Marcelli in the face, arms, and chest, blinding her in one eye and permanently rendering one hand unusable. Her baby was critically wounded in the neck, chest, and abdomen. Jesus Christ. Chest and abdomen. Astofalo... Astolfo was wounded in the chest and head. As Astolfo and Marcelia staggered away from Huberty's line of fire, Marcelia gave their baby to her husband. Astolfo handled her shrieking child to a young woman named Lucia Velasco as his wife collapsed against a car. Velasco rushed the baby to a nearby hospital as her husband assisted Astolfo and Marcelia into a nearby building. All three members of the Felix family survived. Three 11 year old boys then rode their bikes into the West parking lot to purchase Sundays. Hearing a member of the public yell something unintelligible from across the street, all three hesitated before Huberty shot at the three boys with his shotgun, Uzi, and Uzi. Joshua Coleman fell to the ground, critically wounded in the back, arm, and leg. He later recalled looking towards his two friends, Omar Alonso and Hernandez, and David Flores Delago, Delgado. Noting that Hernandez was on the ground with multiple gunshot wounds to his back, he had started vomiting. Del Delgado had received several gunshot wounds, wounds to his head. Coleman survived. Hernandez, Hernandez and Del Delgado both died at the scene. Huberty next noticed an elderly couple, 74-year-old Miguel Victoria Al Aloa, Alua and 69-year-old Ada Vasquez, Victoria walking towards the entrance as Miguel reached to open the door for his wife. Huberty fired his gunshots, killing Ada with the gunshot to the face and wounding Miguel. An uninjured survivor, Oscar Mondragon, later reported observing Miguel's cradling his wife in his arms and wiping blood from her face, shouting curses at Huberty, who then proceeded, who then approached the doorway, swore at Miguel, then killed him with a shot to the head. Approximately 10 minutes after the first call had been placed, emergency services and police arrived at the correct McDonald's restaurant. The first officer on the scene, Miguel Rosario, rapidly determined the location and cause of the actual disturbance and delayed the information and relayed the information to San Diego Police Department as Huberty fired at, Rosier at Rosario's patrol car. Officers deployed immediately imposed a lockdown on in areas spanning six blocks from the site of the shootings. The police established a lockdown on the area. The police established a command post two blocks from the restaurant and deployed 175 officers in numerous strategic locations. These officers were joined within the hours by several SWAT team members who also took positions around the restaurant. As Huberty was firing rapidly and alternating, and alternating between firearms, Police initially were unaware of how many individuals were inside the restaurant. Furthermore, because most of the restaurant's windows had been shattered by gunfire, by gunfire, reflections from shards provided an additional difficulty for police. The glass provided an additional difficulty for police focusing inside the restaurant. Initially, police were concerned that gunmen or gunmen 
might be holding hostages. Although one individual who had escaped from the restaurant informed police there was a single gunman present in the premises, holding no hostages and shooting any individual he encountered. At 5.05 p.m., all responding law enforcement personnel were authorized to kill the perpetrators should they obtain a clear shot. At 5. This man pulled up to the McDonald's at 3.56. Remind, let me remind y'all that. Let me remind y'all. 3.56 was the time he pulled up to the McDonald's. They had gotten a call 10 minutes after he shot someone. And they didn't shoot, they didn't even get the, the, the okay to shoot this guy or go in till 5.05. 3.56, 5.05. That is a long time. They waited all that time and all those people died because they didn't want to freaking go in. Imagine how frustrating that must be for the families. Imagine reading up on like how my family member died and like having to read that the police took an hour just to even approach the building and get the okay. Imagine how frustrating that would be. Like think like my brother or my sister or my mom or my or my cousin or my 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 grandparents could have been alive had the police just went in right away. Like, that's so crazy to me. That's so crazy that it took that long. It's, it's ridiculous, truly. I, several survivors later reported observing Huberty walk towards the service counter and adjust a portable radio, possibly for, to search the news for reports of a shooting spree, before selecting a music station and further shooting individuals as he danced to the music. Shortly thereafter, Huberty searched a kitchen area, discovered six employees and shouting, Oh, there's more. You're trying to hide from me. In response, one of the female employees screamed in Spanish, Don't kill me. Don't kill me. Before Huberty opened fire, killing 21-year-old Paulina Lopez, 19-year-old Elsa Barbero Fierro, and 18-year-old Margarita, Margarita Padilla, and critically wounding 17-year-old Alberto Leos. Immediately before Hubert had begun shooting, Padilla grabbed the hand of her friend and colleague, 17-year-old Wendy Flanagan, before the two began to run. Padilla was... Then fatally shot, Flanagan, four other employees, and a female customer hid inside a basement utility room. They were later joined by Leos, who had crawled to the utility room after being shot five times. When a fire truck drove within range, Huberty opened fire and repeatedly pierced the vehicle with bullets, slightly wounding one occupant. Hearing a wounded, te hearing a wounded teenager, 19-year-old Jose Perez moaning, Huberty shot him in the head. The boy slumped dead in the booth. Perez died alongside his friend and neighbor, 22-year-old Gloria Gonzalez, and a young woman named Michelle Carncross. At one point, Aurora Pina, who had lain wounded beside her dead aunt, baby cousin, and two friends, noted a lull in the firing. Opening her eyes, she saw Huberty nearby, staring in her direction. He swore and threw a bag of french fries at Pina, then retrieved a shotgun and shot the child in the arm, neck, and jaw. Aurora Pina survived, although she would remain hospital hospitalized longer than any other survivor. The incident finally came to an end at 5.17 p.m. Huberty walked with the service counter towards the doorway, close to the drive-in window at, of the restaurant. According to a 27-year-old police SWAT sniper named Charles Foster, deployed a strategic position on the roof of the post office directly opposite the restaurant and obstructed view of his body from the neck down through his telescopic sight. Foster fired a single round from a range of approximately 35 yards, 32 meters. The bullet entered Huberty's chest, severed his aorta, Aorta just beneath his heart and excited through his spine, leaving an exit wound one inch square and sending Huberty sprawling backwards onto the floor directly in front of the server counter, killing him almost instantly. Immediately after shooting Huberty, Foster relayed to the other responding officer he had killed the perpetrator and his focus remained on the motionless suspect. Nonetheless, as so many rounds had been expended from different firearms within the restaurant, police were not completely certain their sole perpetrator was deceased. Entering the restaurant approximately one minute later, a police sergeant focused his gun upon Huberty and noted the movements of a wounded girl. When asked if he was deceased, if the deceased male was a suspect, the girl nodded her head. The entire incident had lasted for 77 minutes, during which Huberty fired a minimum of 257 rounds of ammunition killing 20 people and wounding as many others, one of whom was pronounced brain dead upon arrival at the hospital and died the following day. 17 of the victims were killed inside the restaurants and four in the immediate vicinity. 
vicinity. Only 10 individuals inside the room, inside the restaurant were uninjured were uninjured, six of whom had hidden inside the basement utility room. Several victims had tried to stanch their own wounds and the wounds of their companions with, with napkins often in vain of the fatalities. Thirteen died from gunshots to the head, seven died from gunshots to the chest, and one victim, eight-month-old Carlos Reyes, from a single nine-millimeter gunshot to the back. The victims, whose ages ranged from four months to 74, were predominantly though not exclusively, of Mexican or Mexican-American ancestry reflecting local demographics. Prior to shooting several of his victims, Huberty had shouted accusations or insults. On one occasion, he had also shouted that he himself did not deserve to live, but he was taking care of this matter. Although Huberty had repeatedly shouted throughout this shooting spree that he had been a veteran of Vietnam War, he had never actually served in the military branch. Initial reports issued by the San Diego Police Department Following the massacre, indicated Huberty had shot all injured or killed within the restaurant in the initial minutes after he had entered the restaurant. The claim was hotly disputed by survivors who stated Huberty was shot both wounded and unwounded people over 40 minutes after he first opened fire. I forgot to say, like, subscribe, and share, and yeah, comment down below video ideas or stories that you want me to talk about. If you enjoyed this video, hit the subscribe button, it's really appreciated, and yeah, enjoy the video.